Apollo students, in this video, we'll find the geodesics on a sphere. Let's recall the metric in spherical coordinates is ds squared is d rho squared plus rho squared sine squared theta d phi squared plus rho squared d theta squared. And so in this problem, we're going to focus on just the unit sphere. So that's going to correspond to rho equals 1. So we're going to look at rho equals 1. So here's our unit sphere. That's rho equals 1. And then what does our metric turn into there? When rho is equal to 1, our metric turns into ds squared. It's going to be the d rho squared vanish just because the rho is constant. Then I'll have a sine squared of theta. So this is my surface differential, surface metric, like that. That's my surface metric. And so now I want to do the minimization question, right? So in other words, if I go from a point P1 on the sphere to a point P2 on the sphere, how, what curve can I follow along the sphere that makes that distance as small as possible? So that's the GDS question. How to go? Okay, so in other words, how do you go from P1 to P2 along the shortest path? This is a question that airplanes have to answer if I wanted to fly from um, Detroit to Seattle, for example. Uh, this is my brother. Um, I would have to find out the shortest path between Detroit and Seattle because we're on, we want to think of Earth as a sphere, right? So there's a question of spherical geometry, even though it's a, sort of an oblate because there's some compression at the poles, right? All right, and so that's the question. We want to find out how to minimize this, and so that basically boils down to the following question. So our question now is, I want to minimize. So here's our question. Our question is to find the minimum overall paths from P1 to P2, right? So in other words, overall 5t theta of t curves. I give you a longitude and latitude. The integral, t between a and b, that gives me a curve between two points, right? Integral from a to b of the square root of, now let's do it like this, I'm going to have a sine squared sine squared theta of t d phi dt squared plus a d theta dt squared dt. I'd like to minimize this. And of course, I'm going to turn this into a one-dimensional problem by using the chain rule. So by the chain rule, it suffices to do this. It suffices to look at these in integrals of this form, integral from a tilde to b tilde by changing the coordinates, minimum of what? Of the square root of sine squared of theta. And then I'm going to write this as d phi d theta, d phi d theta. So we're really functions of theta now by the implicit function theorem, squared, plus, then d theta dt turns into a 1. I'm going to pull out a dt squared. I'm going to put the dt squared and pull out a d theta squared plus 1, and then d theta like that. Okay, so now I'm thinking of this as a question of phi as a function of theta. So phi over here is really phi of theta, okay? And I can do this locally on the sphere if I want to, okay? Excellent, so that's my genus equation. Now let's recall the Euler-Lagrange framework. So recall, we've proven this in previous videos, the Euler-Lagrange equations. So if you want to minimize this expression over here, find the minimum overall curves of L of x, y, and y prime, dx, then the following equations have to be satisfied. Then partial L, partial y, the derivative of how this function changes with respect to y, minus partial, partial x of partial L, partial y prime, has to be equal to zero. These are the Euler-Lagrange equations. So if I can solve this system of differential, this differential equation over here, then I will find the minimum, right? So the minimum happens and this is the solution. So these things are equivalent statements to each other. So those are equivalent conditions in order to find the minimum. So we're going to use these Euler-Lagrange equations over here, right? And so of course, our x is really theta. So our x is really theta. Our y is really phi. And our y prime is really d phi d theta. Okay, and oftentimes I'm going to use the letter P for that. That's sort of a traditional way of doing derivatives. So let's write down our Euler-Lagrange equation. So by Euler-Lagrange, 
we have what? So our function over here is really L is really a one plus sine squared of theta and then d phi d theta. So what will dl dy be? There's no phi's in this expression. There's only d phi d thetas. So this first term over here is gonna be a zero. So that's gonna be a zero and then minus d by d what? What's my x over here? My x is theta, so I'm gonna do a theta derivative of what expression? Of the derivative of this respect to y prime. So what's the derivative of this thing? So this is really the square root. This looks like square root of one plus sine squared theta, and then I'm gonna put a p squared over there for the derivative, right? And so what's the derivative of that with respect to p? It's going to be a 2p sine squared theta, 2p sine squared theta, over, over what? Over two square root of one plus sine squared theta p like that, okay? Excellent. This has to be equal to zero which tells me that this expression, that's a, that's a p squared, of course, right, p squared, is that tells me, of course, that, that expression over there is constant, right? So in other words, we, this means that p sine squared theta has to be equal to a constant c times this thing over here, right, times the square root of one plus sine squared theta times p squared, okay? That's my different, that, now that's a differential equation, right? And we're good at solving differential equations. And so I'm gonna square both sides. So I'm gonna get a p squared, p squared sine to the fourth of theta is equal to what? Is equal to c squared, c squared, and then a one plus sine squared theta, p squared. Now we're gonna solve this for p over here. So this tells me over here that p squared, I'll, I'll have a sine to the fourth and then a sine squared over here. So let's pull that out over here. So I'll pull up p squared sine squared theta. And then we'll have a sine squared theta and then a minus c squared. Probably on the other side is equal to c squared. And now we can solve this equation over here. So solving this equation, I'm going to divide by this thing. So I'm going to conclude what? I'm going to conclude that p, so in other words, d phi d theta, which is my p is going to be equal to what? Is equal to the square root of this thing, so I'm going to have a positive c on the square root over the square root of sine squared is just going to be sine. I'm suppressing the absolute values because I'm doing this locally, in a, in a, in a, I can do this locally in any sort of branch. I can patch together two parts along a geodesic by looking a below the equator and above the equator and below the meridians. Sine of theta times what? Times the square root of sine squared theta and then minus c squared. I'm gonna do one final trick. I'm gonna pull out a sine squared from this. This is equal to c over sine squared of theta times the square root of one minus c squared cosecant squared of theta, like that. Okay, great. And now I have to integrate this with respect to theta to get my phi. So what my, will my phi be? This tells me that my phi is going to be, just to pull that c out of here, c, the integral of just a d theta over over what? Over sine squared? Sine squared theta, and then square root of one minus c squared cosecant squared of theta. Great. Now I can make a trig substitution over here. The trig substitution we're gonna make is we're gonna let u be cotangent of theta, therefore one plus u squared is equal to, one plus cotangent squared is cosecant squared of theta. Beautiful. And then du is gonna be negative cosecant squared of theta d theta which just happens to be theta over sine squared, right? That's exactly my du with a negative sign, right? So I make this substitution over here. I have that phi is equal to negative c, then the integral of what? Of du over, then I'm gonna have the square root of one minus c squared and then one plus u squared, like that. This is beautiful, it's another trig integral over here. So what's gonna happen? This is gonna be a, um, like that. So I'm gonna pull a c squared out of there, right? So this is really a, um, let's do this carefully. So this is gonna be a negative c, the integral of du over, and then this is really gonna be a one minus c squared, then I'll pull a c squared out, that's gonna be a square root of one minus c squared over c squared. If I pull a c squared out of that one minus c squared term, that would be a minus u squared, like that and I have to divide by C, right? Divide by C, and that will work out. All right, excellent. 
Okay, and I've just done some algebra over here. I just pull up that c squared. When you pull a c squared out of here, then you're just left with a one minus u squared, right? So you have a one minus c squared, and then a c squared u squared, so that's gonna be a one minus c squared over c squared. And then uh, when we divide that by c, then it turns into a negative one. Great. And so now this is easy to do. This is just gonna be a trig integral over here. So this is like of the form a squared minus u squared. So this is going to be a negative one, and then the sine inverse of what? The sine inverse of what? The sine inverse of u divided by this thing over here. Great, and so let's make sure we're doing all of our algebra correctly over here. So let me just do one sort of small step to make sure everything is correct. So this is going to be, the, the bottom is going to be the square root of 1 minus c squared minus c squared u squared, right? So pull out a c squared from that, and that gives me a c, good. And then we're going to have the square root of this thing, so it's going to be u over whatever the square root of this thing is, right? So it's going to be a c, c u over the square root of 1 minus c squared, okay? Plus some constant over here plus some constants, um, let's call it constant C2, like that. Excellent. All right, good. And so now, of course, that was equal to what? That was my U integration, but U is really what? Cotangent inverse of theta. And this is equal to phi, right? So phi, so phi minus this constant C1, let's change this to an angular variable. I'll call it phi zero. So phi minus phi zero with a negative sign, and of course, that won't change much of anything, so I'm going to make this negative. I'll, well, we'll make it negative again. So negative and positive is going to be equal to the sine inverse of c over the square root of 1 minus c squared, and then cotangent of theta, like that. And now we're almost there. So in other words, what we're going to have over here is we're going to have that the cotangent of theta is going to be just the sign of this thing. I'll pull the negative sign out. So it's going to be some constant a, right? When I multiply this thing, it's going to be some constant a times the sine of phi minus phi zero, which is what? Which is a sine of theta cosine of phi zero, and then minus the cosine of phi, the sine of phi zero. Okay, excellent. So multiply by sine to this, and we'll conclude that cosine of theta, cosine of theta, is equal to some constant, I'm gonna call it um, alpha one, alpha one co uh, sine of theta, sine of theta, and then sine of phi, plus some other constant, plus some other constant alpha two, which we don't quite know, which depends on sine of phi zero, the negative sign and everything, some other constant, cosine of phi, and then sine of theta, Excuse me, now let's think about what this thing is over here. So of course, what do we know? On the sphere, this is my value of z. That's the z component in spherical coordinates. So on the sphere, this really says that your trajectory your, is really a z. This is really a constant alpha one. This is your y, and this is a constant over here, alpha two, and that's going to be your x on the sphere. In other words, this is the equation of a what? Of a plane through zero, zero, zero. So in other words, what are the geodesics on the sphere? The geodesics on the sphere have to correspond to what? The way that you go from P1 to P2 as quickly as possible is you have to follow a great circle. So that's gonna be a great circle. It's a circle that goes through the origin and intersects the sphere. So imagine taking a sphere and if you want to go from points P1 and P2, take a sheet of paper and slice that sheet of paper through three points, P1, P2, and the origin. So those three points, P1, P2, and the origin give you three points, which uniquely define a plane. That plane intersecting the sphere is going to give you a circle. If you don't believe me, just you can. it's a rotationally invariant problem, right? I remember answering this question at Trivial Pursuit one time. The question was, what happens when you take a plane and you slice it with a sphere? Well, if you don't like the orientation of this plane over here, just rotate the sphere, it's rotationally invariant, and the plane, and you're intersecting the sphere with the what? If it goes to the origin, that's equivalent to an equator, and an equator is what's known as a great circle. So in other words, there's an equator that goes between any two points on Earth, right? And that is the trajectory getting from P1 to P2 on Earth as quickly as possible by a curve, and that solves the GDS equation on the sphere. Thank you very much.